Hey everyone, it's Army Gaming. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to Monster Legends. It is time to go over the PvP Blossom Tournament for usage data for the end season. This is the conclusion of the previous era. We're in a brand new era now, the Galactic Era. So now we get to see which monsters ended up dominating the meta. And then we're going to be able to see which of the new Galactic monsters, or we can start speculating on who's going to influence the meta. So far, spoiler, I don't think anyone really has a chance. Maybe Lamuna can get like 1, 2, or 3 usage. Maybe Shaolin can replace some top monsters. Shao Lion. Um, but so far, nothing too crazy. Um, I am using Monster Legends Competitive Wiki to take a look at the stats. They basically look at the top 100 players to see what monsters are being used on offense and defense. Um, Kyrim did warn me that there is like an essay, but we're going to go over it. I'm curious to hear his thoughts. So let's jump into it. Here we go once again, yet again, the end of another Monster Legends era. I'll give my overall thoughts on this season per usual. The biggest thing that honestly surprised me this season was the fact that it was the last one of the era. What I mean by that is that last season felt way more powerful of a season than this one. Most end seasons social point released some insanely strong and powerful options. That is true. This time around it felt kind of like not what we've seen before, right? Like we know when an era is going to end because SP goes out with a bang. They release this monster that has these 5 traits and these 20 skills and can do this and that and this. And this time they were like... Let's release um Yeah, the the, the the last monsters especially weren't anything too crazy. Like I like Shrimp Waiter, but I'm also like, eh, not necessarily needed. The the free monster was like, you could forget about him. Oh my gosh. Alright, let's this time around we did get some good monsters, but for the most part, it was honestly a lot weaker than last season. Season three was great. Um for PvP purposes, I decay if I can see many of the season four monsters making an impact. Perhaps Fireful, he's probably my favorite one from the last season. He seemed very good to me, but he does have a lot of rough support monster competition. I love Vulcan X, but honestly, he's not a very good PvP monster. Too many traits and relics and other stuff that you can't get through very easily to be effective. Shrimp Bader was also a nice looking monster. Maybe not too great for PvP though, considering the state of PvP viable targets right now. All these monsters I mentioned though can be amazing in war scenario. If anything, I think wars are, are eating very well this season. Let's scroll down. The rank of oh. The rank of survival dungeon is also going to be a lot easier now with the new Megaton additions. SP did go crazy with Megatons this time around. Fireful is an amazing trench time for support addition to Fire, Earth, and Underworld. I'm actually ranking him up in the rank of survival dungeon right now. I basically put... I'm actually ranking up Vulcanix as well. I actually like Vulcanix a lot too. So, Attacker Vulcanix, Fireful running team speed, and then a Megaton monster. I'm trying to rank up um, the King and then Epigersis whenever the King dies, if he dies. Sometimes he can make it all the way without dying. Epigersis is the first fire element taunt trait monster we've had in forever. The last one was Solar Flare from the Cosmic Era. He's also, I want to say, the first status caster mega taunt tank in the fire lineup for all the mythic monsters. Honestly, highly underrated addition to fire. Then Fatid and Horbro also both solid additions. Antonation being the first mythic status caster mega taunt options added to the restriction. Man, did SP release three mega taunt monsters in one season? Alright, Shrimp Waiter is a crazy strong addition to both Water and Sea. I've already experienced that first time in my seven years in War. My team had it with Team Spirit. His Relics acts as a lot of damage output and his restrictions is no joke. The rest of the scene was pretty weak, a lot weaker than last season. I can't really mention anyone else, I don't think. Ram has a cool trait, but that's about it. Nyla had a potential, but she ended up being kind of mediocre. Everyone else, I don't have any thoughts on. They're just bad. I don't even remember what Ram does or what his trait is. Nyla was that creator monster that was a combination of Xyla and um, uh, Natael. Yeah, that's it. PvP monster. Alright, let's see. Well, we've got a whole new era to look forward to. Overall, this era was an alright one. I wasn't a massive fan of the raw story. Nothing happened that really caught my attention. And then it felt pretty underwhelming. There are some fun war and PvP monsters we got, uh, to be honest. But I think the, the biggest impact this era really had on the game's meta was the elemental advantage change. The huge random buffs. Dude, seriously, this right here? The dots are killer. Just have a bunch of monsters that do random dots at the start of the battle and you basically lose before you even get a turn. And the insanely powerful new Obsidian Relics that have released through this era. And I feel like they're still getting more powerful. I can't count how many War Coins I've lost due to Avada Malta's um, armor or Saturnus Essence, Shipple Shadow's Essence is a Nightmare. Um, or especially Vulcan X Trap with random dots you can apply terrifying stuff. The talents were all right. Um, there were some pretty fun ones in total. My favorite ones are Sigil, my favorite one. But I'm, I use these all the time. Spiral is also good. Griffin I haven't used. Talico's Harp I also haven't used. 
Um, that said, nothing was quite insane as Doomsday Corrupted Talents. I think SP learned their lesson. All right. Um, the ratio of pay to play Blossom as opposed to them was 84 to 16. Doesn't seem like too much changed with the ratio. A 4% difference to free to play since mid season. This season, I think, was pretty nice for free to play. AP Garrison Strip Raider are nice, but not necessarily must haves. Firefall was a pretty good addition. Free to play, yes, I know another free to play turn charms for support. But Firefall is still really strong in that regard. Also, an amazing monster for free to play to have for wars. Two of the status casts or Megatons were also free to play. Let alone how their Megatons aren't available to later ranks. Especially Horn Roots. Yeah, I, I, it's going to take me a while to rank them up. Um, let's, whoops, let's see. Hydrorium was also recently became available to free to play in the last Boon event. I did not even know that. Uh, the last Bounty Online support to Crazy Lord Harry and Dork were easily available. That was really cool. Um, and yeah, okay. With that being said, let's go on. Let's see who are the top monsters in the game, at least as of the end of the season. And Cherub Cupid has dominated the meta. 84 total usage, 32 on offense, 52 on defense. Cherub Cupid has emerged as the top monster in the game. Moving down, we have Galvanus. Who would have thought the free-to-play bounty hunt monster has taken the second spot at 73 total usage, dominating in defense with 55 beating Cherub Cupid by three, 18 on, um, 18 on offense. Wow. All right, what's the difference? It's an 11 difference. Yeah, it looks like 11 difference. Then we have Elvira Demon Slayer. Look at that. The light element is killing it. 71 total usage, almost out of that of Galvanus. Uh, we have 31 and 40, so a little more um, kind of splits. We have Uriel in fourth place, another light monster. So we have light and fire, light and thunder, light and fire, light and earth. 42, dominating on offense with 42. 200 defense, 62 total. And then we have the king, finally. All right, the king has made it. 10, 34, and 44. So in total, let's see. He basically replaces Pangoliath. All right, then we have Shadow. Shadow's at 27, 14, 41. And Amania. My goodness, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I don't think we've ever had these this many monsters in the heavies. That's crazy. All right, so yeah, we have the king. We have Shadow. We have Amania. Oh, they were so close too. 27, 27. She went out by one defense. I've seen her in defense. If you don't have an answer to, like if you're not running the Shock Beast, and if you don't have any anticipation monster, she will destroy you. I, I play King on defense with a Serpent Axe and then Ryzen to triple damage buff. I, I fought a Shadow that was like three speed at like over 30k speed. She trade disabled, removed positive effects, turn transferred, trade disabled, like... I was like, what the heck? How does the AI know what to do? Yeah, it just destroyed me. Destroyed me. I personally, I like using Amonia more for offense because she can cleanse negative effects when she turn transfers. Like, even if she has a negative effect herself, like if the enemy has a poison beast, poison kills your magic monsters, right? Because it's nature elemental advantage. So I'll do emotional Pisces onto myself, cleanse the poison, and then I'll do the one turn um, extra turn, the one turn code and extra turn scout, the one that removes positive effects. And then I'll do the damage boost skill, and then I'll do the cleansing positive effects again, and then I can do Pisces onto the main attacker. So I prefer Amonia for that case. I don't necessarily care that I can't trade disable, especially since I normally tend to run a Pierce. Um, yeah, but that's just me. All right, moving on, we have the Toffee Serpent Tex at 27. It's funny too because like Cherub Cupid and Serpent Tex basically the same monster, except this guy has ET skills if they're needed, right? Not to mention, I think trait-wise he has Bulwark, which is significantly better. But yeah, I mean, you get different talents too. So with these talents, you can you can block, um, you can run Sphere of Destiny, remove positive effects, block Resurrection. Uh, with this talent, you can you can run Vata Magma and just apply some more dots and really kill the enemy monsters. So yeah, I can see why that's what it is. Um, I do have to wonder if Serpentex was not a monster. I wonder how much higher Cherub Cupid would be. Like, it'd probably be over 90. Because, look, 27 player, 22 players are using them on offense, 5 on defense. Like, what are those 5 could be added here? That would already be 89, and some of the offense was also added. So, yeah, it makes me think. If Serpent Tex wasn't around, where would Cherub Cupid be? We have Neradia. That's interesting. Neradia, 15. She's the Aeroshot monster. 
So for release from the very beginning, we have Sparkus, a Taunt Megaton Monster. We have Teddy Bomb, a Dodgeria Monster. Volt, an ET Attacker. Elf, an Anticipation Pierce Monster. Elgata, Dodge Area Buffer. Forge Labs, Buffer. Mother Talica, Buffer. Fire Fool at 4 2 2. Uh, support, Churn Transfer, Marimotis, Taunt, Megaton, Anticipation. We have Chi Long, Rariz, Goldfield, Nabotis. I think at this point they don't matter too much. Hidrorian, Clash, Bluera. Pango died. He's at 2 now. Lord Inheritor, Fruit Taster. Again, remember when these were the top monsters, Slumster, Fruit Taster. Oh, how the time has changed. Oh, look, Slab is down there as well. I recently I recently started using mine just for war. Uh, Worm Lad, Fusion, and so on. Yeah, I think at this point they don't necessarily... Oh, Hornroot. Vulcan Yeah, at this point they don't matter too, too much. All right, guys, so those are the top monsters from the end of the season of the Blossom Era. Let me know what you guys think. Do you disagree? Do you think someone else should be on the top? What do you think Cherub Cupid would be if Serpentex was not there? Any thoughts you guys have about this or the upcoming um, PvP rankings, how they're going to look like, especially with the Galactic Era? Do you think anyone has a chance to make it into the top 100? Any thoughts you may have, let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much, and remember to subscribe.